All right, so hello everyone and thank you for being here. My name is Paul D'Ambrosio and I teach Chinese philosophy at East China Normal University where the Sahai Weisue Collaborative Learning Project is based. I want to welcome you to our 17th lecture of the Sahai Weisue Collaborative Learning Project. Today we are hosting Professor Sandra Wariko of San Diego State University. The topic of her lecture is Fixed Mind versus Growth Mind, Emotional and Cognitive Impediments to Globalizing Philosophy. So um, normally I would just go on, but I want to stop here for a second. Um, I think it's worth noting that at Sahai Weisya, we don't request that lectures present on any particular theme. Um, we only invite people who we sort of trust their judgment. We think they have good judgment. And then their topics uh, are basically always accepted. So. Um, however, in this case, I want to especially welcome Professor Wariko's talk because the main goal of Sahai Weisue collaborative learning is to promote better understanding between people from different backgrounds. So thinking about how our emotions and other cognitive aspects might serve as impediments to having more open global conversations could not be more appropriate for this forum. So. Um, I really thank you for for bringing uh, this topic to us, and I and I'm sure the conversation will be very interesting. So um, we have an excellent lineup of scholars to discuss with Professor Wariko. Our first commentator is Professor Banka from Oxford University. Our second commentator is Professor Chung from York University, and our chair today is Professor Daniel Serafinis my colleague in the School of Philosophy at East China Normal University. Before getting started and handing things over to Professor Serafinis, I would like to say a few things about the Sahai Weisue Collaborative Learning Academic Forum. The Sahai Weisue Collaborative Learning Project hopes to distinguish itself from some of the less productive conventional practices we sometimes see in contemporary academia. As posted on our website, we are not interested in male peacocks, in jerks, or in any form of egoism or self-promotion. We hope to curb all types of aggressive and look at me, I'm smarter than you, or don't I know so much, and similar types of attitudes we sometimes find in academic exchanges. The Sahai Weisue Collaborative Learning Project seeks to accomplish these shifts in orientation during academic exchange by encouraging productive communication, humble discussions, real questions, and responses that are open and honest. We want to foster environments where people truly learn from and with one another. So I wanna thank again, everyone for being here, especially the commentators, um, and also an extra thanks pr to Professor Wariko um, for giving us so much time for, for preparing a PowerPoint. Um, and on a personal note, I also want to thank you um, because a few years ago we had an exchange in Dow. And exchanges like this are sort of, in my view, sometimes um, perfect breeding grounds for people to express self-centeredness, to sort of uh, for some ego bashing, for being very nitpicky, um, and for other expressions, I think of their own sort of personal vanity or sometimes just plain meanness. Um, but that didn't happen in our exchange. And uh, that was really great. And that didn't happen because you started in such a way as to make that not possible. So um, thank you. And I think that really, and I don't know you at, at all really outside that exchange, but um, that's that makes us want you to be part of this community. So um, thanks again for being such a humble and engaging person. Um, so uh, our chair again today is Professor Daniel Serafinis. Um, he's pro research professor of Chinese philosophy and the program co coordinator of the International Graduate Program at uh, East China Normal University. Additionally, he serves as a fellow for the Sahai Weisue Project, and his areas of research include critical philosophy, Lao Zhong thought, early Chinese political thought, and other issues surrounding collective identity. Thank you, Professor Zarafinas. Thank you, Paul. And um, special thanks to Professor Rico for 
uh, joining us this morning or this evening, depending on where you are. Um, maybe I'll, I'll introduce the commentators before they fulfill their role as commentators. But first, I'd just like to also send a thanks to um, Professor Rafael Banca and Professor Julianne Chung, um, who will provide comments after Professor Wariko um, concludes her presentation. Um, but first, the main event, uh, Professor Wariko is a professor of philosophy at San Diego State University, where she specializes in Buddhist and Taoist epistemology and aesthetics in the context of neuroscience, global aesthetics, uh, and Asian models of leadership amongst other areas. Um, and prior to uh, um, us opening up, I, I, I uh, heard her mention that she will soon start a master's in global philosophy. Is that true, Professor Warika? A, a minor. A minor, that's sorry, not a master's. Start with a minor. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, so this is very much connected to her presentation today. Uh, she also is working on a current book project, uh, uh, reading the tale of Genji through the Lotus Sutra, um, Mirosaki's philosophical insights. And she's editor of the Asian Thought and Culture series published by uh, Peter Lang. Um, so today her presentation will be on fixed mind versus growth mind, emotional and cognitive impediments to globalizing philosophy. So let's all give a warm welcome to Professor Warika. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be with this community uh, and like-minded philosophers who would really like to cooperate and collaborate. And I'm very interested in seeing how you respond to my attempt to make this happen. So one of the main problems that I've seen over the years is unconscious bias on the part of philosophers who are, the word that comes to mind is addicted to what we call the canon. The canon is discussed quite often by many of my colleagues and it, it, it contains the important texts of Western and primarily European philosophers starting with Plato, Aristotle, Kant, Hegel, Heidegger, and that's taken to be the real core of what is philosophy uh, and very Eurocentric. So this unconscious bias is something that is not necessarily something they're aware of. And that's where some of the cognitive problems comes in. So I wanted to start out with one way of dealing with this unconscious bias, and it comes from uh, Gina Davis Institute on Gender in Media Studies. It's not philosophy, but uh, they have the same kind of issues. And so the question for them is why certain injustices persist and how best to combat them. So in, in our context, it would be injustices in terms of misunderstandings uh, and mispresentations of Chinese philosophy. And the president and chief Ex executive talks about this and their theory of change relies on the content creators to do good. As Gina says, we never shame and blame. You have to pick your lane and ours has always been, we collaborate with you and, I, and we want you to do better. So I think that's an effective way to try to deal with fellow philosophers who are not aware of the resources of Chinese philosophy. So this collaboration through cooperation is equally something that we need to expand the horizons of philosophy in the 21st century. So what prevents cooperation among philosophers today? Philosophers from various backgrounds. So the lover of wisdoms across the, the globe, one way to look at their approach to philosophy has been discussed in terms of fixed mind and growth mind. So static versus dynamic, dogmatist versus explorer, carpenter versus gardener, 
uh, guarding the ashes of tradition versus passing the torch. So these are the orientations of not just philosophers, but individuals in general. So the problem that I see has to do with the fixed mind cult of certainty. They're looking val for validation of truth. Uh, for thousands of years, God was the source of the truth with a capital T. Uh, then there were a variety of sacred texts. And as I already mentioned, the canon. The canon, which is the beginning and the end of where philosophy originated in their minds. So this is where I started to look at the psychology of learning. So there's a psychologist by the name of Carol S. Dweck, who has written a rather popular book called Mindset, uh, Changing the Way You Think to Fulfill Your Potential. Uh, so this has to do with how people come to learn about different topics uh, and what some of their impediments are. So these dueling, dual in the sense of two, but also dueling in the sense that they can be in conflict with one another, uh, the fixed mind versus the growth mind. So fixed mind has a problem with insecurity, a fantasy of control. And as I mentioned, this need for certainty in all particular areas. We find this um, manifested in the desire for perfection, eternal universals, looking at a teacher as a carpenter uh, and the student as someone who needs to be molded. One of the self-descriptions of such a molded student uh, was feeling like an excellent sheep having to follow some authority figure who is going to tell you what that truth is. And we find a bit of a parallel there with uh, the Confucian Shunzi, who talks about straightening warped wood in terms of students. On the other hand, we have growth mind, which is fearless rather than insecure, is engaging with reality rather than trying to control it, uh, and understands probability is very often all we're going to have. So it's a very dynamic context that depends on relationships. Teachers are seen as gardeners, whereas the students are budding plants and their role is to be nurtured by the teachers. Uh, and again, another Confucian, Mengzi fits in here uh, and he talks about cultivating the four seeds. So I see quite a bit more of growth mind in Chinese philosophy uh, and more fixed mind in Eurocentric philosophies. So we have some specific examples of this in Socrates and or Plato, uh, the dialogue called the Mino, discusses what constitutes learning. We never learn, we just remember. Recalling pre-existing data. So what you know has already been fixed prior to this incarnation. So this is from the Mino. As the soul is immortal, has been born often and has seen all things here and in the underworld, there is nothing which it has not learned. The soul has learned everything. Nothing prevents a man after recalling one thing only, a process men call learning, discovering everything else for himself. If he is brave and does not tire of the search, for searching and learning are, as a whole, recollection. So everything you need is already there. And in some cases, some people will never get to that recollection. And then we have Wang Yang Ming with his mellifluous song of joy in pursuit of the way, in which learning is seen as a dynamic process. I particularly like to share this passage with my students. To rejoice is to rejoice in this learning. To learn is to learn this very joy. Not to rejoice is not to learn. Not to learn is not to rejoice. You rejoice, then you learn. You learn, then you rejoice. To rejoice is to learn. To learn is to learn this very joy. Oh, the joy of the world, how learnable it is. The learning of the world, 
how joyful it is. And you might notice there is no joy that's mentioned by Socrates or Plato. So the cognitive errors of fixed mind that I have assessed uh, have certain causes and also can be explained in terms of logic, the fallacies of presumption. So it begins with ignorance, not knowing what it is that you're judging and very often judging to be inadequate. So there's a sense of carelessness and inattention to the facts. And that leads to insecurity, a sense of competitiveness, uh, the need for a hierarchy. So everything has to be placed in its correct position. And this we can see in somebody like Plato, whose um, republic is going to be very hierarchical. And finally, appropriation, othering, which leads to a sense of aversion or attraction to the other as distinctly different. So when we think about it in logical terms, the fallacies of presumption can presume and lead to error in three different ways. Either, either overlooking the facts through hasty generalization, sweeping generalization, or false dilemma, evading the facts by circularity, special pleading, or appeal to authority, and distorting the facts, irrelevant conclusion, false analogy, and false cause. So the analysis of Chinese philosophy, for example, very often is erroneously characterized because of exactly these fallacies. Now, I recently came across an article that talks about fixed mind in terms of science, but I think you'll see that there's quite a few parallels to the problem as it occurs in philosophy. In this particular case, the source of truth, where we're going to get our certainty from, is artificial intelligence that now takes on the position of authority that, that God might have previously for other individuals. So the article is called Artificial Intelligence and Illusions of Understanding in Scientific Research. But every time we look at the science, we can also see substituting philosophy in that position. So there are competing priorities between artificial intelligence and humans. That's what some people assume. So artificial intelligence is objective. Humans tend to be subjective. AI is quantitative versus humans being qualitative. Uh, AI provides predictions whereas humans provide explanations. So this is from the article. Uh, AI's appeal comes from promises to improve productivity and objectivity by overcoming human shortcomings. But proposed AI solutions can also exploit our cognitive limitations, making us vulnerable to illusions of understanding in which we believe we understand more about the world than we actually do. So I think you can see how that fits in with ignorance. Such illusions obscure the scientific community's ability to see the formation of scientific monocultures in which some types of methods, questions, and viewpoints come to dominate alternative approaches, making science less innovative and more vulnerable to errors. So AI tools are thus viewed as being objective and universal replacing the work of diverse knowers and therefore cultivating a monoculture of knowers. The epistemic risk of this monoculture becomes clear when considering what is lost when removing human diversity from scientific work in the form of both demographic diversity and different attendant life experiences and cognitive diversity arising from different disciplinary training skills and problem solving strategies. So is a very narrow sense of where truth and certainty can come from by disdaining the importance of diversity in a variety of ways. So the term monoculture actually comes from agriculture. So in agriculture, the monoculture is the practice of growing only one crop species in a field at a time. 
This practice improves efficiency, but makes the crop more vulnerable to pests and disease. Just as plant monocultures are more vulnerable to pests and disease, scientific monocultures make our understanding of the world more vulnerable to error, bias, and missed opportunities for innovation. So I think you can see that those monocultures also exist in philosophy. Monocultures of knowing limit the range of questions asked and methodologies applied. Monocultures of knowers limit the range of viewpoints. So the epistemic risks are detailed in terms of three different illusions. So in general, these are illusions of understanding or cognition, uh, a class of metacognitive errors that arise from holding incorrect beliefs about the nature of one's understanding. In other words, we don't know what we don't know. So there are three, illusion of explanatory depth, illusion of exploratory depth, and the illusion of objectivity. So these illusions are all attached to artificial intelligence in this case, but for philosophers could be attached to the so-called canon. So I'm using here the images that are in the article because I think they give you a, a nice visual sense of what they're talking about. So we've got the computer, AI, which we're depending on for certainty. And the human being looks at the data that has been manipulated by AI. Uh, so predicting X and the outcome is an accuracy of 97%. So in the mind of the person using AI, they believe that they understand X. So they have a huge understanding, 97%, because of what AI has told them. But then actually their understanding is much smaller. So they are, in a sense, overcome by their adoration of the ability of AI to provide us with data. So someone incorrectly believes they have a deeper or more comprehensive level of understanding than they actually do. It's also referred to as unconscious incompetence. The second illusion, exploratory breath, We've got, again, the human being depending on AI and looking at hypotheses that are testable using AI, but they erroneously think of that as encompassing all hypotheses, when in fact, not all hypotheses can be dealt with by artificial intelligence at this point. So this accompanies monocultures of knowing in which the scientists falsely believe that they are exploring the full space of testable hypotheses, whereas they are actually exploring a narrow space of hypotheses, testable using AI tools. So they're missing out on a large amount of necessary knowledge. And the final one is the illusion of objectivity. So again, looking at what is the standpoint of AI, and yet assuming that AI is able to encompass all possible standpoints, or in another sense, it has no standpoint itself. So this one I think is particularly important because what's happening here is that the scientists falsely believe that AI tools do not have a standpoint or are able to represent all possible standpoints whereas AI tools are actually embedded with the standpoints of their training data and developers. So the idea that AI is actually objective is another illusion. So like sciences, philosophy requires human diversity, demographic diversity with different attendant life experiences and cognitive diversity arising from different disciplinary training, skills, and problem-solving strategies. And of course, this is the sort of thing that Chinese philosophy can provide to Eurocentric philosophies. Now, this particular um, slide I added myself because it gives us evidence of the non-objectivity and implicit 
bias of artificial intelligence. So these are three separate uh, news articles, but they all have to do with the problem of using AI in order to have facial recognition. So in the first one, the title of the article says it all, artificial uh, uh, facial recognition is accurate if you're a white guy. Because the persons who are programming the, uh, the AI are white guys, primarily, of a certain age, as we'll see. Uh, therefore, it works for that kind of an example, but it does not work for other groups. So you can't have ethical AI that's not inclusive, and whoever is creating the technology is setting the standards. The next article is Google's photo app still can't find gorillas and neither can apples. So errors can reflect racist attitudes among those encoding the data. In the gorilla incident, two former Google employees who worked on this technology said the problem was that the company had not put enough photos of black people in the image collection that it used to train its AI system. So the programs have been, uh, let's say, tampered with so that they will not make any attempt to identify gorillas because they had been identifying black people as gorillas. So that's a huge problem that they have. Another article, systems falsely identified African-American and Asian faces 10 to 100 times more than Caucasian faces. Among a database of pho photos used by law enforcement in the US, the highest error rates came in identifying Native Americans. The technology also had more difficulty identifying women than men, and it falsely identified older adults up to 10 times more than middle-aged adults. So all of these other demographic groups who are not likely to be the ones who are programming the artificial intelligence, they cannot be legitimately recognized. So the objectivity is obviously not here. So the authors conclude future work should explore how a researcher's expertise and stage of training affects their susceptibility to the epistemic risks of AI. One strategy to mitigate the epistemic risks that individuals might face is to work in cognitively and demographically diverse teams. So diversity among philosophers will improve the results. So the field of philosophy has the same susceptibility to these uh, epistemic uh, risks and therefore could greatly benefit from cognitively and demographically diverse teams. So expanding the range of questions asked and methodologies being applied and welcoming diverse viewpoints. So now I have a, a case study what happens when a student of philosophy succumbs to the three forms of illusion noted above, having been conditioned to believe that the Western canon has explanatory depth, in other words, that it allows for a complete understanding of reality. Uh, it has exploratory breadth in terms of encompassing all possible hypotheses uh, and also has objectivity. It is the sole repository of truth. Now it might seem extreme to see that some of our students uh, who are being taught the Western canon would come to these conclusions. But in fact, many of the students that I work with do have that kind of disposition, let's say. And I have a concrete example for you. So what we'll see is that fixed mind engages in constant judging and evaluation while his growth mind has a voracious appetite for learning, constantly seeking out the kind of input that you can metabolize into learning and constructive action. So one is static, one is dynamic. So in the fall semester, I taught a seminar, graduate seminar on Taoist philosophies. And at the end of the semester, I had a final commentary for the students. Uh, there are two questions. What is the most unexpected or astounding philosophical dimension of Taoist philosophy 
that you have encountered in class readings and your own research? And what is the most important contribution that Taoist philosophers, past and present, can make to philosophy in today's world? So this is one of the responses. The other responses were more open-minded. This student was more fixed-minded. So the student says, I have not found much of astonishing novelty in Taoism so far. This is in part due to the fact that I feel like I found most aspects of Taoism in some forms in the writings of Nietzsche, Heidegger, Deleuze, and Guattari. The similarity here is on the emphasis on the topics of nature, thought, anti-philosophy, anti-humanism, anti-structures, anti-languages, becomings. I had been exposed to those ideas already in the continental tradition, and in my opinion, I favor these figures' conceptions or analyses over those of the overly romanticized notions of Taoism. So I think you can see here that this student who at the beginning had no connection with Taoism, no understanding of Taoism, after 15 weeks, he basically is saying that eh, whatever Taoism has, you can find it uh, in the continental philosophers. I think we can all see that that's a, um, an error in thought. So ignorance was the initial denial of the existence of Taoism as philosophy by this particular student. Their sense of insecurity is shown by dismissing Taoist philosophies as potential rivals to the canon. So he wants to go back to the canon. There's nothing Taoism can tell him that he hasn't learned already. And then appropriation in terms of his aversion to Taoist romanticism. And the use of the term romanticism about Taoism, I find quite strikingly absurd. Uh, and I tried to talk to him about that, that, that his notion of romanticism um, comes from a Eurocentric position. Very difficult to impose that on Taoism. So that might be something we can talk about in the questions. So what we're dealing with has also been called the Kruger-Dunning effect, that the less people know, the more they think they know. So the starting point for fixed mind is unconscious incompetence. The most crucial shift begins when we get to the stage of conscious incompetence. Now, I think it's interesting and very helpful to see that Socratic wisdom fits under that category. And that's the beginning of growth mind. Socrates himself was told by the Delphic Oracle that he was the wisest man in the world because he knew he didn't know and everyone else was at the stage of unconscious incompetence. So this is where I tried to get my students uh, in terms of their cognitive shift. Uh, once you get to conscious incompetence, then you can move on to conscious competence uh, and then eventually unconscious competence where you don't even have to think about your level of uh, competence. So let's talk about the allegory of the map. Fixed mind philosophers prioritize theory over practice, just as AI focuses on prediction over explanation. Uh, special attention is given to providing metaphysical maps that pre present their various versions of reality. While theories themselves are not necessarily problematic, the fatal flaw is unquestioning loyalty to the maps and the map 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 makers such as uh, Socrates or Heidegger or whoever it is you want to choose. Since past philosophers did not have access to information that we have garnered over thousands of years, particularly through the flourishing of technology and the sciences, these philosophers in the past should not be summarily dismissed for their errors. And often those errors are grounded in sexism, racism, and even speciesism. However, the dogmatic way in which they present their theories and the subsequent slavish adherence to them must be exposed to remove the cognitive impediments. So in terms of philosophical methodologies, we start out with herd wisdom. So students become fixated on the maps of authoritarian figures, uh, which is not philosophy, but ideology. 
uh, and are guarding or even worshiping the ashes left by the past. If they continue on, they, they can move into intellectual wisdom where there's an effort to understand the maps and perhaps even engage in map making for oneself. But is this only adding to the ash heap? And then the experiential wisdom, which is exploring the territory the maps attempt to depict. And that would be the growth mind that is passing the torch. And now I'd like to mention an indigenous philosopher by the name of Lee Hester in an article called Truth and Native American Epistemology, uh, which is an inspiration for my map image. She says, when you have mistaken the map for the territory, that is the theory, you will continue to claim that you have reached the right destination even when you are hopelessly lost. So Lee argues that in the West, the map is taken as a true account of the territory. The map is mistaken for the territory. For the Native American, both the map and the territory are real, but the map is not understood as a true picture of the territory. The Western understanding of true belief is absent in Native American epistemology. So that's this notion of certainty that one has the true belief when basically we just have a theory. So as Darwin's theory of evolution began to take hold in Europe, scientists set out to map the evolutionary process by classifying species in taxonomies. Seeking certainty about that process, they relied on the fixed-minded adherence to hierarchy, assuming primitive inferior species evolved into complex superior species. And Homo sapiens was considered the obvious pinnacle, uh, the uncontested top species. So why am I talking about this? Well, it relates to my notion of the platypus syndrome successive responses to anomalies. The first response is to deny the existence of something that was previously unknown. Second stage, dismiss or categorize an anomaly as obviously inferior. And then finally, denigrate, disparage, or exoticize the other. So each of these was experienced by the platypus, when it was first discovered by European scientists. So for this reason, I refer to African, Asian, indigenous, and Central South American philosophies as platypus philosophies. Because like the platypus, they do not fit into the European taxonomy of philosophies. Initially, the platypus was considered a hoax once its existence was confirmed, the platypus was erroneously regarded as a primitive precursor of mammals, an evolutionary dead end. And after more than 80 years of debate, this would be again among scientists in Europe, the scientists had to admit that this anomaly was a unique species deserving of its own category. So this unique species from the standpoint of Eurocentric philosophy would be all of the philosophies from Africa, Asia, indigenous cultures, and Central and South America. So in that regard, the platypus was given its own identity as a monotreme, its own species. Mammals that are animals that provide milk for their offspring, but also lay eggs. So fixed mind philosophers can restore their cognitive and emotional functionality by cooperating with platypus uh, philosophies. And that put me in mind of Shakespeare's Hamlet, uh, where Hamlet says, there are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. So the philosophy here would be the canon. There's more outside of the canon that also qualifies as philosophy. So Dong Long Shi asks us, is it time that we went beyond such a dichotomy, European versus non-European, and made efforts at cross-cultural understanding based not on self-generated myth, but on reality? 
on the real concerns about real people outside our own group or community. Affinity does not mean sameness without diversity, and difference does not mean incommensurability that denies the very possibility of comparison. So what he's really asking is, can we collaborate? Can we work together as philosophers? So perhaps we can learn about cooperation by emulating dragons. So this put me in mind of the hexagram one in the I Ching. Uh, and if all the lines are changing, the I Ching text tells us, see a multitude of dragons without heads, auspicious. So we can think of dragons getting together, not to compete, not to conflict, but to auspiciously cooperate. So thank you for your attention. I welcome your questions and suggestions to further cooperation among philosophers. All right, I'll do the stop share. Okay, thank you so much, Professor Lorico. So now we're going to um, open up to our commentators. So we'll start with our first uh, commentator, Professor Rafael Banca, who received his PhD in philosophy from uh, Jagiellonian University and is currently an associate faculty member uh, in the philosophy department at the University of Oxford. His areas of research include Chinese and Western comparative philosophy, including metaphysics, aesthetics, and methodology. And um, his book, Cognition and Practice, Lee Zaho's Philosophical Aesthetics, was published at the, uh, by State University of New York Press uh, in 2022 and can be found where all fine books are sold. Um, so please, Professor Banca, um, we open the floor to you. And then after uh, Professor Banca uh, asks or, or makes his comments or asks his questions, Professor uh, Warika um, is welcome to respond. And also, I just might uh, point out for after the commentators, we are going to have a, a, a period for um, other questions from the audience. So uh, for those of you who maybe have a question or comment they'd like to uh, make, uh, you can put it in the um, in the chat section, and I'll call on your name based on uh, who asked questions. But please, uh, Professor Banca, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. First of all, uh, thank you very much for inviting me as a commentator. It, it's it's and thank you for this uh, very inspiring speech. I tried to make as many notes as possible, but I certainly missed a lot. Uh, I, uh, what I uh, like uh, very much about this talk is that it's it's very up to date. It's very contemporary in the sense that uh, we are in perfect time to discuss this issue. Uh, we can somehow justify the lack of uh, openness or inclusion between different philosophical traditions in the past uh, for obvious reason, because the interaction between the intellectual traditions or basically intercultural or intellectual exchange was not so intense, but now it's uh, it's a different thing. And uh, there comes this question, why are uh, philosophers representing different traditions uh, find it so difficult to uh, be open to uh, a diverse uh, uh, philosophical uh, business. So um, I was uh, mostly uh, interested in uh, in where to begin. Okay. Um, so uh, I, I like this uh, 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 solution that is given by uh, Professor Vavritko that uh, we are in, in some way um, blinded by by some paradigm the canon and it's very difficult to uh even if we confront other philosophical traditions uh to um at least suspend 
epistemologically suspend this canon and uh, try to understand a different philosophical tradition. That's why we probably appropriate uh, different philosophical traditions on our own terms. And uh, I would be very interested in, uh, in if, if Professor Fabrizio could further tell us, because we have already located that problem that we, we, have, we succumb to appropriation, uh, objectivity, and uh, explanation and exploration uh, uh, risks and so on. But uh, on the other hand, the Western philosophical tradition has developed many uh, different logical models. It's We can say that it's very self-controlling uh, and uh, in a sense, it should have some solution uh, to reformulate itself and become open uh, to different philosophical traditions, but it doesn't happen. And I would like to uh, uh, learn more about why uh, in Professor Vavritko, uh, Professor Vavritko's opinion, this is uh, the case. I also like uh, uh, another, I think another very big and uh, important thing is this uh, kind of uh, schizophrenic condition of, of Western philosophers who uh, begin with theory and stop at the theoretical level. And even if they think about uh, um, the dialogue between philosophical tradition, it's a top-top dialogue, and then it, that's a top-down uh, procedure. We talk about some theories, philosophical models, metaphysical models, and then we sort of like uh, uh, chisel uh, reality according with these uh, traditions. Uh, and nowadays, considering the, the, the development of neuroscience, neuropsychology, um, and also uh, uh, cognitive sciences, uh, don't you think that it offers, uh, it opens an avenue for reformulating philosophies methodologically and and uh, and um, and make it more compatible uh, for uh, an intercultural philosophical dialogue? Because if we refer to, uh, especially in epistemology. If we refer to uh, um, uh, studies in in cognitive sciences, neuropsychology, we can see that these paradigms are very theoretical; they're incompatible with reality. And maybe this is a good starting point from bottom up to the theoretical level, which can bring us to this, uh, um, hopefully, this uh, global level of uh, uh, doing philosophy. These are my questions. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Excellent questions. I believe that it hasn't happened yet, as you said, even though we're a globalizing uh, world, basically because there's this cult of certainty, that there's this sense that we have to have the truth with the capital T, uh, and there's these delusions about how civilization begins in Europe. It's much more complicated than that. Uh, and that philosophy, because it's a comes from a Greek root, that it was invented by the Greeks. Uh, in fact, there's a book that is from Egypt that dates back to the um, 1900 BCE, where there is the term philosophy in Egyptian, which actually translates as a seeker of wisdom. So even the term philosophy could have been taken by the Greeks because they had been influenced by the Egyptians. So that I think is a, a sense of hubris that we can see is very much a part of Greek culture and is the basis of the Greek tragedies. The tragic heroes of the, uh, the, the great drama in ancient Greece are hubristic. And so they realized hubris was a problem uh, and yet that hubris has continued to go on uh, in terms of things like imperialism and colonialization. Uh, so that I think is a is a very difficult aspect and the assumption that we have a superior civilization uh, and then all these other groups, their cultures maybe, but we really don't see them as equal. So there's where the hierarchy comes in. There has to be somebody at the top of the pyramid. In terms of the 
the lack of the experiential wisdom, I think that is a very important aspect that's missing. And when I was doing the seminar on uh, Taoist philosophies, those two questions that I, I um, mentioned for the final commentary, even the person who I quoted realized with all the other students that the one thing they most appreciated about Taoism was the application to environmental problems. So that experiential wisdom in terms of the relationship to nature that can be found in Chinese philosophy, but also in indigenous philosophies, that they felt was extremely uh, significant and something that was not found uh, in the Western tradition. Uh, and then the final one about the the use of of cognitive sciences, I think that that's a, one of the things that has attracted me in the last 20 years or so to look into cognitive science, to see that this can be corrected if we understand what the causes are. So once we understand what are the the sources, the illusions, as the that article I, that I quoted from talk about, we can try to get people using tools like logic uh, and have them reassess what they had previously assumed to be the truth. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Professor Banka. Um, so we'd like to welcome our second commentator, Julianne Chang who is Associate Professor of Philosophy at York, York University in Toronto. Her uh, primary areas of research are epistemology, philosophy of language, aesthetics, philosophy of religion, and philosophy of mind. Um, and she is, in regards to Chinese philosophy, she's particularly interested in uh, connecting aspects of the Zhuangs are related to those fields to uh, contemporary discourse. She also serves as uh, associate editor of Oxford Studies in Epistemology and as a member of the editorial board for the Journal of Analytic Theology. So, um, Professor Chung, uh, the floor is yours to make any comments or ask questions for Professor we Rorika. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I've been a bit, I've been a bit under the weather, so I'm a little congested still. But hopefully, I'm coming. <clears throat> hopefully, I'm coming through okay here. Um, as I turn up my volume on my computer, as if that will help any of you. Um, all right. Well, thank you for such a stimulating and, and fascinating talk with so many different different kinds of uh, considerations um, brought to bear on on this question. I guess of how we can, uh, I guess, better cooperate uh, as as philosophers and maybe academics more broadly. So many things I I could say. Maybe we'll start by you know saying something a bit funny, right? So. Uh, I I can't help but feel you know particularly uh, empathetic to uh, let's see this idea that there's a cult of certainty or a cult of truth abound not just in philosophy right or even the sciences but perhaps more broadly in you know at least the cultures with which I have the most experience right and so this this for me would be European cultures uh, and so in my own work I've been you know sort of playing with this idea of creating something like a cult of doubt even if ultimately there are no distinctions between these, um, going along with some of what we see in the Zhuangzi, right? That questions the accuracy or legitimacy of distinguishing it all. And in that spirit, I'm uh, particularly curious about the purported distinction between fixed mind and growth mind, right? So I'm thinking to myself, all right, insofar as I'm thinking through uh, some of what uh, Professor Warrico is saying and asking myself, all right, how might I use some of this to think about how we can be more open-minded? I started thinking about um, what you were saying about these being perhaps dual, but perhaps better dueling mindsets. And I'm thinking of like kind of like a friendly duel, right? Where you've got a bit of a spar between the two uh, such that, look, one might think it's not as if growth mind as characterized in terms of fearlessness, engagement, and probability might not have its problems, right? Maybe it's nicely balanced by some aspects of what Dweck calls fixed mind, such that these two perhaps modes of mind, rather than like strictly speaking mindsets and you got to have only one, right? If you're an individual, um, presumably perhaps people could make use of both 
uh, such that we could see in this will echo, you know, aspects of the Zhuangzi as well, that the fixed can transform into, say, a uh, growth and, you know, growth can transform into fixed in a way that can engender cooperation between different kinds of mindsets, both maybe at the individual level as well as the interpersonal level. I mean, even thinking about uh, what was said about the uh, Mino versus uh, what um, was said about uh, Wang Yang Ming, right? this idea of learning is remembering uh, and learning is a dynamic process, I thought, yeah, you know, but I could see remembering, especially in light of contemporary uh, reflections on remembering as a certain kind of process too, and maybe even a constructive one, right? Uh, and so to, I guess, connect a bit better with uh, some of what was said later then, um, you know, applying these ideas to particular interpretations of student remarks, right? I couldn't help but think, all right, first of all, my main problem with what the student said was that he simply didn't answer your question, right? You didn't say, what did you think about the course? You asked him specifically to please render you know, some sort of assessment about what was different. And he just said nothing. And you're like, well, you, you couldn't even look for something, right? I mean, if, if you really mean nothing, I want to see a, you know, you, you don't have enough time to explain, you know, why it would be nothing really. And, you know, why not engage the question kind of thing. So, so it's kind of interesting that that happened. And I couldn't help but think, well, he was so fixed. In a way, he was so growth that he refused to answer the question. Right? In another way, he was so fixed that he he would would appear, I don't know your student, of course, but he would appear to perhaps have just been saying what, what he wanted to say, right? Without even Without even looking at the question. And so I guess I'll wrap up um, my remarks very quickly with just a, a remark on unquestioning loyalty, right? So I've I've um, stated in my comments just now that I'm coming from a place of, uh, say, really taking seriously ideas in the Zhuangzi that interrogate distinctions, right? Either like, we can say maybe questioning them, being skeptical about them, if not outright denying them, and thinking about how that can help me to uh, transform along with different aspects of the world, maybe including growth and fixed mind, and therefore perhaps just open myself up such that I'm no longer thinking so much in terms of concepts, especially when I'm interacting with different scholars, but taking in what they're, you know, attempting to convey to me on their own terms as much as possible, which leads me to think, and this will connect with the AI stuff just to conclude here for real, <laughs> if I already used that word. Um, you know, I'm thinking, all right, well, maybe the AI programs that have been discussed can't have no standpoint or be open to all standpoints or anything like this because they're not trained to. But I can't help but wonder whether some of what we see in Taoist philosophy is such that it really does train people to be a certain kind of pivot point that maybe isn't exactly no standpoint or all open to all standpoints, but might be close, right? Especially if we look at some of what we see in the Chi Wu Lun regarding you know, say, being the axis of all courses and in Brooks of Porn's translation, for example. So with that, uh, I will conclude my remarks and I'll be uh, very curious, uh, Professor Warwicko, to hear what you have to say. Thank you so much. Well, I think I have good news for you because there is a place you can go if you want doubt. Uh, as already has been mentioned, um, my main area of uh, research is Buddhism. Uh, and in Buddhism, you start with great faith, and then the second stage is great doubt. And the Buddha specifically says, don't believe anything I told you. You have to figure it out for yourself. And then you get to the third stage, the final stage, which is the death of delusion. So that really takes care of the cognitive problem uh, overall. Uh, and you can also find in Buddhism the view of no view. So exactly as you were describing, uh, the Buddha would listen to people in terms of trying to understand what their their view was uh, and not being judgmental. And I think it's very difficult for people not to get engaged in judging what they're hearing. Uh, and that's why the original quote that I gave uh, about the mission statement uh, of that group that's not philosophers, they also don't want to blame or shame the other they just want them to stop acting in a stupid way. They just want them to be more open. Uh, and if you start the conflict, then it just makes them uh, respond in a, a more serious way. So you, you need to open up the channels. 
And I found your the question, particularly about the open mind and the growth mind uh, and how they interact with one another. The psychologist Dweck, she after she wrote the book originally, she's recently done a um, an expansion of it uh, with more studies that she did. And she found out exactly what you had been talking about, that it's not an either or that people who have some aspects of growth mind also have some aspects of fixed mind. Uh, and so we're not saying that one is bad and one is good. Fixed mind becomes bad when it refuses to listen and takes on the cult of certainty. Uh, and there also can be a growth mind that is so eager to find new experiences that it's it's just running all over the place. Uh, so that actually has some parallels in neuroscience when we talk about the ventral and dorsal attentional uh, systems. One of them is more fixed and the other one is more like the growth mind. So the very good questions. <laughs> Great, thank you very much, Professor Chung. Um, so before we open it up to the audience, I just want to make one quick comment and also a quick uh, question. Um, one of the uh, ideas that uh, was brought to mind when uh, Professor Rico was presenting, and I think she actually mentioned this a few times, and also to some degree it relates to Professor Banka and Professor Chung's comments, is um, the notion of ideology, but particularly uh, Emile Durkheim's definition of, he provides a very broad definition of ideology, uh, which is the use of concepts to govern the collation of facts rather than deriving concepts from facts, which I also thought of when Professor Banco was uh, asking about philosophy's predilection to uh, remain in the realm of theory from the top-down sort of perspective. And then maybe that theory trickles down into empirical data, but usually it doesn't. Um, and I, anyway, I was just thinking of the, re the relationship between that fixed mind perspective and ideological dogmatism. Um, and in the Zhuangzi, this is also, uh, I think, referred to as the Chengxin or the, the completed mind. Right? Um, but I wanted to also ask uh, Professor Warika if, um, so you also deal with uh, neuroscience and you, you were uh, you spoke about cognitive science as well. Now I'm wondering if cognitive science doesn't also carry with it its own uh, ideological biases or presumptions. So I'm wondering if the use of uh, neuroscience and cognitive science to interpret Buddhist and Taoist text, which is I'm sure we're all familiar, is very popular uh, in uh, Chinese, uh, language literature, so using people like Maslow to uh, interpret the Laozi and the and uh, the Zhuangzi. So I'm wondering if using cognitive science doesn't maybe uh, just import or project those ideological biases that are inherent in science into the Buddhist and Taoist texts, or do you think um, by using Buddhist and Taoist texts? it kind of turns that monoculture of the scientific community into a, um, uh, or in a plural, into a plurality of, of props, so to speak. The point about the neuroscience, I think is very important. There always is that tendency for science to go back to the, the cult of certainty, one of the sources that I've been using uh, is a neurologist by the name of Austin, uh, who also happens to be a Zen Buddhist practitioner. Uh, and so he brings to his neurological and neuroscience discussion uh, his own Buddhist experiences. Uh, and I find him to be not only a, a very credible um, source, but I've also found that the students uh, are very interested in the way he presents his work because he he has very complex, uh, sophisticated writings, but he also uh, is able to write for a, a much broader audience and does a lot of the, the research and studies with actual individuals 
so that the, it, it goes beyond the theory and moves over to the experiential wisdom uh, component. Great. So in other words, there is sort of at least an awareness of the dangers of dogmatism within this community. Right? Yes. Uh, yes. And I think, it, as I mentioned earlier, that there's quite a understanding of the, the problem of dogmatism in Buddhism from the very beginning. And so the Buddha is very clear that you don't want to look at him as a, an authority because awakening is something that you have to experience for yourself. Great. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to turn now to some questions from the audience. Uh, so the first one from James, who um, is, is like to echo Professor Chung's concerns about the interaction of fixity and growth and ask whether it's possible to collaborate in terms of fixed mindsets across traditions. So maybe to rephrase that, I'm not sure if I'm exactly getting what James means here, but Maybe uh, you can think of people with their own fixed notions of canon. So can somebody who is has a fixed notion or a fixed mindset regarding, let's say, the five classics or the Confucian canon uh, have a conversation across traditions to somebody with a fixed mindset um, as it regards the Western canon, something like this? Yes, so I think that it's possible to get the fixed mind to remove the dogmatism by presenting them with counterfacts, things that go counter to what they assume they're going to, um, to find in, let's say, Chinese philosophy. One of the biggest problems I have with some of my colleagues is they don't believe that there is such a thing as logic. So logic is really something that is invented by the Greeks and so on and so forth, and that there's uh, no precursors to what has been invented by the West. And then I point out to them that there are logical texts. Buddhism uh, is well known for many of its uh, logical texts and it's a matter of ignorance. They just don't know enough and they therefore just assume uh, based on very minor exposure to what they assume to be the case. And then when I provide them with the actual evidence of there's something else here, take a look at it, then they begin to open up at least on those kinds of topics. So it's a dynamic process. Uh, once you are not blaming and shaming the other side for being fixed, but giving them the alternative to look at the additional information. Great, thank you. So would you maybe say it's simply exposure to other traditions that might kind of chip away at that rigid uh, fixed mind set that you mentioned? Yes. Or an open I, exposure maybe, because I, I, as you mentioned, your graduate student was exposed to Taoist philosophy, <laughs> but perhaps wasn't so open to it. Yeah, he's a work in progress. <laughs> okay. Uh, and one of the images that I used in particularly in my Buddhism class, the very first day of class, I ask students to empty their teacup. Uh, what do you think Buddhism is? And then we talk about uh, all of the errors in their assumptions about what constitutes Buddhism. Uh, and mm -hmm. starting with a, an empty teacup and going to the actual texts of the historical Buddha, we begin to build a sense of what Buddhism is really about and not what Hollywood tells you Buddhism is about and other you know, popular sources. Okay, thank you. Um, so if uh, we have any other questions from the audience, uh, including our two distinguished commentators, um, it doesn't look like we have many um, questions in the chat, but maybe we can just open it up to, if you have a question or a comment, just feel free to um, chime in. I guess I'll go ahead and chime in. So, I mean, I've long been fascinated by the possibility that 
that we do see, because I don't know enough about European philosophy, as it turns out, to rule it out, the same kinds of ideas coming up in European philosophy. But as it turns out, they haven't been emphasized or explored as thoroughly as some have been, right, for various socio-historical reasons and so forth. So I yes. do really curious to yeah know more about that like if I had such a student I would really want him to explain himself and be like tell me more <laughs> you just have a lot of work to do right like I don't know exactly why right you're you're saying these kinds of things like oh all of this is in Nietzsche already like maybe it is right but but I want to know <laughs> like because I don't know I don't know my Nietzsche right like I like I know my Duongsa. um I, I I feel like his reaction was more indicative of just a like just a refusal to do what you'd ask uh, and and you do see that with with professional philosophers too, right? Um, which which makes me wonder just how to get people most interested in doing intercultural philosophy, right? So, like, just to yeah, I mean, th- this will this will not really you know add much other than another anecdote that that kind of indicates I think you know some tendencies that have already been explored by Professor Wariko. But I remember when I was in graduate school, I did not study Asian philosophies until very close to the end of my program. And I didn't do that until Jay Garfield showed up and gave a talk to graduate students about why we all need to be doing this. And I said, what, like, I don't, you know, I mean, the problems I'm working on are such that reading anything beyond 1996 is like history. So, I mean, Asian philosophies, why, why would I do that? And so he asked me to come to his office uh, if I wanted to, and, and he would tell me more, right? So, you know, skipping through parts of the story, I, I started to engage Asian philosophies more on the basis of our meeting. And at some point, uh, another instructor <laughs> said to me something like, look, either, you know, what we're seeing in Asian philosophy is the same as what we're already seeing, right? <laughs> in terms of like what we're doing in, in non-Asian philosophy, or it's different. If it's the same, then why do we need to do it? We're doing it. And if it's different, <laughs> why do we need to do it? It's not a thing, right? And, you know, of course, I'm, you know, caricaturing the argument a little bit, but it is something, you know, of a double bind that that pulls on many of us who are looking to incorporate different kinds of philosophies. Uh, and I'm curious about whether, um, Professor Rorico, you have any additional thoughts on these double binds that that we encounter, because I feel like there is something to them. And I want to give people good responses to them. And there's just so many different ways that something could be a good response. So I'm, I'm curious about what some of your ideas are. I think that's a very important point. And one of the things that I felt was the most successful in the Taoism seminar is that the, the students were asked to do their own research and they had a wide variety of topics that they wanted to look at. But they also were able to find the same patterns of Taoist philosophy in, let's say, Western sources. And they were surprised by that. So I think your point that they, it's not that these ideas had not been considered within European philosophy, but they're on the sidelines. They have not been embraced. They've already got the, the main path that people are wanting to go on. Uh, but you you have people who are exploring those things and making those connections and seeing that uh, this is not something that is in the DNA of Europeans versus the DNA of Chinese, but they're all human beings. And it it's based on the interpretation of, of their experience. So one of the areas that we looked at in terms of Taoism uh, is Taoism uh, as and is an indigenous philosophy. So there are some aspects of it that are very much parallel with indigenous philosophies. That's not saying that they are identical, but particularly in terms of the respect for nature uh, and the lack of human exceptionalism, uh, which the student that I quoted really wanted to hang on to. He wanted to have human exceptionalism. Uh, So that, that was one of his problems with the romantic side of Taoism. Uh, so when they begin to explore on their own, and it's not something I gave them, but they found it, then it takes on much more uh, influence. So this this is something that we can work on. So one of the students uh, who is very good at mathematics was very interested in the, the notion of, of no-thingness or nothingness. Uh, and he 
is starting on a project to have a parallel between Taoist logic uh, and its notion of uh, emptiness, or I'd like to call it no-thingness, uh, and this um, contemporary mathematician who has been exploring the same concept. Uh, so he's become very uh, enthusiastic about seeing these connections that previously uh, he had never imagined would be possible because they're two very different cultures. But it, it came as a as an inspiration to him to, to give a, a fresh look at what seemed to be a closed case. Hey, can I ask you what that math mathematician's name was or else I'll be going down a Google rabbit hole on my own? <laughs> oh, I can actually send you uh, his final um, report. Oh, that would be wonderful. I'd be so yeah. curious. Yeah. yeah, so if you could, uh, I can get your email. I can send you that. Yeah. Thank you. I think we uh, might have time for one last question or comment if there's uh, anybody in the audience that uh, I'm just going to check to see if there anybody has their hand raised through a little emoji. No questions about the platypus? <laughs> I think we all have questions about the platypus. <laughs> Still, <laughs> we happen. To I don't blame those early researchers for being utterly confused by the platypus. By the way, San Diego is the only place outside of Australia you can actually see a pair of uh, the platypuses. We have them in our zoo, and I saw them. Oh, but it looked. Sorry, it looks like Raphael um, wants to make a comment or a question. <laughs> yes, I kind of find this icon of. of um... Of, uh, of the hand raised, but it, it's just, you know, uh, maybe not a purely theoretical question, but um, um, in the long term, would you, because artificial intelligence is already involved in some um, processing of philosophical paradigms, and uh, of course, no one has a, an unlimited number of paradigms, but uh, these paradigms can be combined and generated lead with the generation of new paradigms and so on and so forth. And this in in some time may lead to uh, artificial intelligence reflecting philosophically reflecting upon itself. So from the point of view of inclusion, uh, do you think that it's possible that after some time we'll have to consider including artificial intelligence as a legitimate participant of the philosophical discourse, similarly to human philosophical traditions? That is a question that I think that is very open. I've been very um, engaged in looking at the possibilities and also the limitations of artificial intelligence. And we're only at a beginning stage here. So I, I would not want to say that there is no possibility for uh, artificial intelligence to contribute to philosophy. The problem, as I pointed out, is that the limitation of AI reflects the limitations of the programmers and the limitations of their own mindset. Yeah, but let's let's consider a possible world in which mm -hmm. you know uh, artificial intelligence absorbs all possible empirical data, all possible paradigms and its mm -hmm. flaws in this respect. Because of course, we now we base on some limited data. Let's say this data is unlimited. It absorbs everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, and so that gets us to the question of consciousness, which is a huge question uh, and has so many different meanings and interpretations uh, that it's it's very difficult to even define what constitutes consciousness. So that's something that is, has also drawn me to, to the neurosciences to see what some of the explorations that they're doing. I, I'm not going to rule it out. I think that there is a possibility. Thank you. I might add, I wonder also if these different AI models might have their own uh, 
ideological biases or fixed minds. So if anyone's familiar with the uh, Baidu version, I guess, of, of chat GPT, which is uh, Wenyan Eason, I think it's called. Um, and if you play around with both of these, it becomes very apparent that the programmers for, for both of these uh, sort of chat models uh, programmed into the AI system ideological biases. So I remember playing around with both of them and asking uh, questions revolving around gender roles. And it became very clear which ones reflect <laughs> or, or the Wen Yan Yisen very clearly reflects uh, Chinese notions of gender roles and uh, chat GPT very much reflects um, Western notions of gender roles or the lack of distinction in terms of gender roles. So I'm wondering if uh, maybe different AI models will simply be like all of us having their own sort of uh, unique ideological biases, blind spots and fixed minds. Yeah, I think, I it, think would require, I, I, it would require the, uh, the artificial intelligence to liberate themselves from their programmers. Uh, and at what point that may or may not happen um, will be very interesting to see. Right. And then is it even, well, the question then becomes, is it even possible to come from a, even for AI? This is sort of one of the questions I think central to the uh, dialectics of eminence and transcendence, right? Is it even possible to extricate oneself from, um, I don't feel entirely liberated from my program. <laughs> so can, can AI achieve sort of this uh, impossible God standpoint of, of having no ideology or no fixed mind or no perspective whatsoever? But... Well, based on my study of Buddhism, it would be an awakened mind. <laughs> uh, yeah. But... Maybe AI can become, uh, can reach nirvana. If none of us can, at least AI can. <laughs> Does it have the Buddha nature? That's the question. <laughs> <laughs> and then many Buddhists would say yes. Nothing that does not have it. <laughs> I was going to say, well, Nirvana is samsara. We're already here. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, so it appears that we're, we're uh, inching up on our uh, deadline of 1130. So if maybe if nobody else has any last comments or questions, um, it doesn't look like there's any indication from the audience that there's any more questions. Um, so why don't we just take this opportunity to uh, send a big thanks to our commentators, Professor Chung and Professor Banka, um, and an especially big thanks to our presenter, Professor Borica, um, for this very uh, inspiring, I would say, uh, presentation. Oh, sorry. Um, Maybe we do have one. We have a few minutes. Let's let's just uh, give some time for Blank Lee, um, who asks. Um, Darwin's theory of evolution was mentioned. Since I have a background in biology, I'm curious to know if AI can potentially occupy a position above humans in the food chain. Given that AI does not require significant energy consumption or relatively complex physical structures, is this question still worthwhile to consider? Wow. Very technical question. I, I, Professor Warika, do you have a, an opinion on this? I suppose it would depend on whether we could think of artificial intelligence as a species uh, in the same way that we look at other definitions of a species. So can a, can yeah, a machine, a, a mechanical construct, does it qualify uh, as a species or is it a platypus yeah <laughs> that's paul as paul says yeah but anyway um i think that maybe is too big of a question to really approach uh right now but uh, anyway big thanks to professor warika for a very uh, inspiring and stimulating uh presentation um, and thank everybody else for, for participating, contributing. Thank you for the, your input. All right. So have a good rest of the day or good evening, depending on where you are. Mm -hmm.
Thank you.